This is the 51st lecture in an FOA series of lectures on fiber optics. This is the first of a three-part series on fiber optic network restoration. In this lecture, we'll cover the causes of damage to the cable plant that can require restoration. In the next lecture, number 52, we'll talk about planning for restoration, things you can do that will make it easier, and perhaps less likely, and then Lecture 53 will cover the restoration process itself. There are lots of causes of network outages, including cable plant damage, equipment failure, infrastructure damage, natural disasters, and even damage that occurs during installation that doesn't show up until later. Let's take a look at all of those. Many cables are installed underground especially in cities and suburbs. And those cables can be installed by a number of different methods of construction. When we think of underground construction, we often think of the classic digging a trench, burying conduit, or direct burial cable. But there's a lot of construction going on now with micro trenching, where you just dig a groove in the center of the road and drop a cable or conduit in, and directional boring. A lot of fiber is also installed aerially, either on typical utility poles in urban and suburban areas, and on transmission towers like these shown in the right, fiber is used as optical power ground wire at the top of the towers. Damage to underground cables is often caused by what we call backhoe fade, but it may not necessarily be a backhoe. It can also be an auger, like the construction shown on the right, digging up cables, or a directional boring when it's not aimed correctly. Directional boring can simply uh, break communication cables, and you'll never know it. It's only when it does things like uh, puncture water mains or sewers and floods areas, or causes major damage with fires when it breaks gas mains, like shown on the right. Aerial cables have their own problems. In uh, very rural areas, it's often target practice, where some hunter gets tired of uh, not finding any animals to shoot at and decides to shoot at cables. But aerial cables are particularly uh, susceptible to damage by uh, vehicles when they hit utility poles and bring all the cables down. Animals also like the taste of the jacket on cables, so you'll often find uh, cables chewed through by uh, rats, uh, gophers, uh, even squirrels on aerial cables, and, um, well, the one with the woodpecker is unusual, but it's a possibility. Aerial cables are also often damaged by weather. Uh, ice and ice storms are particularly difficult because they weigh the cables down until they break. Improperly sealed splice closures often get flooded and will freeze in winter. We call these splicicles. Storms can be particularly damaging to fiber optic infrastructure, with hurricanes, for example, bringing down utility poles, as shown on the left, and floods, flooding the entire infrastructure, including all of the uh, manholes, handholes, getting to all the underground cables. Those of us who live in the West know all about wildfires. Wildfires are notoriously bad on infrastructure, uh, burning poles uh, enough so that they just topple to the ground. You can see fiber optic cable laying along the ground in the center picture here. And then the picture from the right is, well, a little unusual. That is uh, Hawaii and uh, lava burning a cable. A lot of the problems that uh, cause outages in fiber optics are human caused. It's mistakes made during installation or moves, adds, and changes. The owner of a fiber optic cable plant should be certain that only qualified workers get near their cable plant. 
workers that are trained and certified by legitimate bodies like the FOA. Be very careful about subcontractors. Uh, we know lots of situations where damages occurred because the contractors were good, but the subcontractors were not. Here's an example of what a subcontractor can do. A landscape contractor sent us these photos from a southern city. They were doing landscaping work and discovered under the grass, right on the top of the ground, a fiber optic cable. Laying cable on the surface of the ground is not a legitimate way to install fiber optic cable. Here's another way that didn't work. It was called nano trenching. It was used by Google Fiber in Louisville, Kentucky. They buried the cable just below the surface of the road and covered it with rubber cement and all the cables popped right out of the road. That's not a recommended installation method. These guys are installing an 864 fiber cable worth about 10 bucks a foot along a city block in Santa Monica, California, pulling it through conduit. They're pulling this cable over a pulley, noted by arrow number one, that's about the right size for rope. It's about five inches in diameter. It needs to be about two feet in diameter or more because that exceeds the bend radius of the fiber and is probably damaging both the fiber and the construction of the cable. They're also pulling the cable, see arrow number two, right straight up out of a conduit without any uh, particular attention to bend radius there. Here's an example of an installation crew ruining a fiber optic cable. Here's another example of a cable that got ruined by an installation crew. Coming up out of the ground and up to a pole, they kinked the cable. The cable had over a half dozen broken fibers and a number of fibers with high loss. Here's an example of when a very well done installation may cause problems for the next contractor if they're not good themselves. This is a micro trenched cable and you have to look very closely where the arrow is because the cable is buried right at the junction between the curbing and the asphalt. It's very, very hard to see. The cable is only about 12 inches deep. There are six micro ducts here that can handle six 288 fiber cables. You can make a big mess by digging this cable up. If a contractor comes along doing any kind of construction and does not know that cable is there, they can do a lot of damage. That's why services like call before you dig, click before you dig are so important. Contractors should never dig until they know what's where they're digging. With aerial cable construction, it's almost always easy to see what's going wrong. Here's a crew installing a new cable along a messenger on a pole literally around the corner from FOA offices. The two bucket trucks are sitting in the driving lane of the road and they are working over the tops of cars. I wonder what the owner of that BMW SUV would think if they dropped that giant lashing tool down through the roof of his car. And what were these guys thinking when they left these giant coils of fiber optic cable hanging from poles over the sidewalk? The one on the left we figure is about a thousand feet, 300 meters of cable, weighs a couple hundred pounds, as do probably the others, and they're right over sidewalks where people are walking. One, it's harmful to the cables to leave it up there. Two, it can be harmful to pedestrians below. And three, how do you get the cable hung up there and brought down without damaging the cable? How many messes can installers make in one block on cables? This is the same section that we showed you the guys in the bucket truck working over the parked cars. 
If you look closely, you can see at least 10 different situations where the cable is installed inappropriately. There are a lot of things you can do as the owner of a cable plant to prevent potential damaging situations. The first one, of course, is to design the cable plant properly, and we'll talk about that in the next lecture. Have supervisors overseeing the contractors that know what fiber is about and how things should be done correctly. Qualify your contractors and, and, and all of their subcontractors. Require licensing and certification for all workers doing work on your project. Get complete cable plant documentation, including GIS root data, which can be used to warn the next contractor digging in the area where your cables are. And get complete fiber test data to make sure that your cable was all installed properly. That's what tells you it was done right. Our next lecture, Lecture 52, will talk about planning for restoration. What you can do during the planning and design process to make sure that you build a cable plant that can survive the real world. We're the Fiber Optic Association, the International Professional Society of Fiber Optics, and the recognized certifying body for fiber optic techs. You can find lots of information on our website at foa.org.